Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, hello, listeners. Uh, Today, I am recording not at my usual place, uh, but in a hotel room. So uh, it may (laughs) sound a little off or look a little off, but uh, we're we're making the best of it. And we are so delighted to have with us Becca Tarnas. And uh, I'll just tell you that um, I uh, attended a webinar that she uh, put on a few months ago. And I was so excited when I got the announcement about the webinar because it was about Jung and Tolkien, two of my favorite subjects. And it was such an inspiring webinar. And I said, we've got to have you on the podcast. So she was kind enough to make time for us. Becca is an assistant professor in the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program at the California Institute of Mm -hmm. Integral Studies. Her doctoral dissertation was titled The Back of Beyond, the Red Books of C.G. Jung and J.R.R. Tolkien. And her research interests include depth psychology, archetypal studies, literature, philosophy, and the ecological imagination. She is the editor of Archai, the Journal of Archetypal Cosmology, and an author of the book, Journey to the Imaginal Realm, a reader's guide to J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. She's currently researching and writing a biography of Stanislav Grof, a co-founder, Transpersonal psychology. So, Becca, thank you so much. I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's a pleasure to be here and to meet all of you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, um, uh, Becca, I, I know I am an extraordinary fan of Lord of the Rings, uh, the books, the movies. It's uh, an enormous paradigm that rummages around in my backwoods of my mind. <laughs> And of course, you did this extraordinary um, research that found a, a powerful congruence between what this meant to Tolkien to write the um, Lord of the Rings books and what it meant for Jung to be at the same time working on his Red Books. So uh, set the stage for us. How did this all c- come to you? That's a it's a great opening question, and uh, it's something that actually began to open up right in 2009 when the Red Book was published, when Jung's Red Book was published. And now I had been a, a devotee of Tolkien's work, a, a, an explorer of Middle Earth since I was mm. about nine years old. And Aww. I deeply loved the the stories he'd written. My fourth grade teacher read us The Hobbit, and I felt a deep familiarity with this place, with Middle Earth, with the names. It was as though I already knew these names somehow. The landscapes were very Mm -hmm. familiar. And I remember going home and telling my, my mom about it, and she said, oh, we'll wait till you read The Lord of the Rings. And so it was... A couple years later, that I read The Lord of the Rings. And it was an absolutely life changing experience. And uh, it, I became very invested in this world of Middle Earth. And it, it just completely filled my imagination. And so um, I read everything I could of Tolkien's. And then in 2009, when Jung's Red Book was published, the first thing that stood out to me was that the, first of all, the name The Red Book, in the context of Tolkien's world of Middle Earth, there is a book that's called The Red Book of Westmarch. And it's essentially the Red Book of Westmarch is 
a is the story of the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings compiled in one volume. Within the context of the story, there's this uh, this book that's been written down and then passed from Hobbit generation to Hobbit generation. And this is uh, Tolkien's conceit of how we have the book, the Lord of the Rings, in our hands. And so when I first came across Jung's Red Book, I thought, well, that's interesting. There's a red book and a red book and didn't think too much of it until I got a copy of it. And when I saw that copy, I thought, well, this looks like a book out of Tolkien's world. The calligraphy, the illustrations, um, they had very similar ways of, of drawing, of painting, uh, of this kind of medieval style of calligraphy. And so that's, that sparked a kind of curiosity. I thought, maybe there's something more here. And there was the voice that said, that's ridiculous. Why would there be something more here? And <laughs> so I, I began to explore further. And uh, one of the things that really first stood out was one of timing. That when Jung began his Red Book period in 1913, when he started to have these kind of waking visions, these fantasies, and then, you know, the practice of active imagination was opening up these imaginal experiences for him. Uh, that was exactly in tandem with when the young J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, 17 years younger than Jung, was creating this book of extraordinary illustrations. He called it the Book of Ishness. And there were these symbolic illustrations that he uh, only gave titles to, no explanation that anyone can find. Uh, it might be in his diaries that are written in Elvish, but other than that, um, <laughs> they're just these amazing symbolic drawings. And he was doing that exactly in tandem with the beginning of Jung's Red Book period, making these illustrations. There's a lot of parallels between the two. And that was the period as well when he began writing the first stories of Middle Earth beginning in 1914 with a poem, uh, and then very, you know, not long after that, the first stories that he called The Great Tales of Middle Earth. And so the timing was there, and then I just kept delving deeper and found probably not just dozens, probably a couple hundred parallels between the two works. And the more I delved into it, the more I thought, okay, this is quite a research project, and it ended up becoming my doctoral dissertation. So that's how it that's how it got going. So you're a kid, you find the Lord of the Rings, you enter into that world. Um who did you most identify with? <laughs> you know, that's a good question because I in some ways I I didn't identify particularly with one figure. Uh, one character right. from the Lord of the Rings, but in some way felt a connection to each of them, almost like I was my own mm -hmm. person in relation to them. But what I did feel very strongly, uh, which is interesting to talk about now in my 30s, that my, you know, my 16-year-old self is probably thrilled that I still get to talk about these things. I felt like with the elves, I had found my people. Um, there was this part of me as a teenager that felt convinced that I didn't really belong to this world of, you know, being in high school and living in a in an urban area, although there are parts of the Bay Area that definitely have their Middle Earth qualities that I really sunk into. But I just felt this deep cultural connection with the elves. Like I I just wanted to go and, and be a part of their world and that something would make sense. So I think that was the strongest mm -hmm. identification, not maybe with one character, but this uh, this culture, these people um, who had an totally aesthetic and a way of approaching the world. Elf. Becca, I can totally <laughs> see you as an elf. God, you, you've definitely, you've got the look. So, and that's a compliment. Oh, so I well. thought about the, uh, Lord, <laughs> the characters in the Lord of the Rings. And if I were to put them on the kind of uh, typological spectrum, I thought all the elves are basically INFJs. <laughs> and so, so I'm wondering if you're an INFJ. You know, I very close. I am, I would say I'm more of an INTJ. 
Um, so I am very much a thinking type, which makes sense. I, I work in academia um, and feeling is my inferior function. But fortunately, I have my husband and other wonderful people in my life that remind me it's important to feel. <laughs> So I'm wondering if that's so so useful that something about the reading the Lord of the Rings wasn't just the ideas of it, but it made you feel something because feeling is so numinous when it's the fourth function. I mean, just extraordinarily numinous. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. so Seth? I, I'm sure no. I'll... Oh, oh. I'm sure all our listeners know that uh, you're talking about typology, uh, which is uh, one of Jung's discoveries, and then it got converted into the very well-known Myers-Briggs personality or type inventory. So th that's just uh, a little background for anyone who might need that. So, so if I may, I'm curious, Joseph and Deb, if you guys had a particular character uh, or part of the book that you really resonated with. The wizards, of course. <laughs> I mean, like. Of course. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. I'm a wizard okay. and I'm looking to take an elf as a lover. You know, like that's the perfect <laughs> setup for me. <laughs> You're right. I can totally see it. <laughs> <laughs> Deb, what about you? Uh, well, I think that leaves the realm of the hobbits to me. Um, <laughs> I think I could be very happy in the Shire. Okay, uh, I see uh, that too. Uh, cooking things and uh, puttering around. And, and having uh, second breakfasts. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, they have what? They have the second breakfast and then Elevenses and then, <laughs> and then tea. I like that a lot. But it comes up to about six meals a day. That would that would work fine. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, great. I really, really loved Lady Eowyn. Mm. And I uh, felt that she got cheated by not... It, I really felt that she should have wound up with, uh, with Strider, with Aragorn. But, <gasps> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. That whole Rohan thing was just heading south. I'm not sure that was going to go anywhere good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, I mean, she does play an important role, right? She yeah. kills she the king of the Nazgul. So, That's right. I mean, she she is she is a powerful feminist. There, I am no <laughs> man. <laughs> Gives it to him. So, in you know, any case, yeah. So, I've, so swinging back to yes, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say with with Aowen, uh, she's a very interesting figure in that. Uh, maybe I'll put a little defense for how how Tolkien had things unfold because. I think that she, when she meets Aragorn, he's such a powerful solar figure, kind of the solar hero. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he has mm -hmm. an, an extraordinary lunar side as well, which you see in the Houses of Healing, for example, in The mm -hmm. Return of the King, that he isn't just uh, the warrior and, uh, you know, the hero in that sense, but he's also, he's a healer. Um, so he has that solar lunar kind of conjunctio in himself. But I think when Eowyn meets him, she recognizes the solar in him that's actually inherent in her. And I think she's a really beautiful mm -hmm. example of what we could think of as the solar feminine. And that she is this autonomous, heroic individual whose life circumstances, primarily because she was born as a woman, don't allow her to step into that. And so the her love for Aragorn, I would posit, is almost like a projection of her own solar potential. Mm. And it's by his oh, yeah. rejection of her that she seeks death, which symbolically we can almost see as the solar journey, that she seeks that descent into the underworld, which the sun takes every time the sun sets into the west. So she seeks death and she seeks mm. uh, a heroic death on the battlefield. And then the beautiful twist that happens when she actually faces the Lord of the Nazgul is that it's the very patriarchal language that's actually defined the whole story. We speak of elves and men, the men of Gondor, the men of Rohan, the men of Numenor. 
that just completely disguises, as our language has up until about the 1980s, that it's not just men, it's humanity. And, but that's what protects her and allows her then to have this extraordinary turn where she is able to uh, overcome the prophecy that the Lord of the Nazgul was supposed to be, you know, he couldn't be slain by any man. And then her response, well, I, you know, I am not a man. You look upon a woman. And uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's just a really amazing turn uh, that I think lets her claim her solar identity that she'd projected onto Aragorn. And then coming into relationship with Faramir, which I do think probably could have been fleshed out a little more. But he's such a lunar male. He's nurturing and caring and about, he's also about, you know, healing and knowledge and so forth that um, in some ways I think they make more of an archetypal pair that she's the sun and he's the moon, um, which you don't see as much represented in, um, you know, we often associate the male with the solar and the female with the lunar, but I think with them it's reversed, which is actually something that's in Tolkien's cosmology. The sun is feminine in his mythology. The moon is masculine. Uh. It's in the language that he uses. And I think that it gets kind of represented at a more microcosmic scale with the two of them. So um, Eowyn is one of my favorites as well. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, that's, that's, great. that's a little that's bit great. of an analysis of how I've thought about what unfolded for her. And just to make sense that she doesn't get the romance that you think she deserves as you're getting to know her. No, that's beautiful. Mm. So let's take a moment to talk a little bit about Jung's Red Book so we can flesh that out because I'm imagining that it has not yet been made into a three-part miniseries, which we hope one day it might. So people are less familiar with the narratives of the Red Book. And then as you begin to weave for us this resonance, this echo, between what Tolkien is experiencing in his imaginal world and what Jung is experiencing in his yeah. imaginal world and how uncannily those things seem to echo each other. Well, with Jung's Red Book, it began, the process began spontaneously. And the, the, as he describes mm-hmm. it, the pressure had been building in the unconscious for some time. And scholars point to different potential causes of what led the experiences that are recorded in the Red Book to come forth. Um, You know, many have attributed it to the break with Freud, which came on the heels of him publishing uh, the uh, uh, transformations and symbols of the libido in 1911 and 1912. Um, He himself has spoken about the pressure building in in Europe that l- led to the outbreak of World War I, that he was very yeah. tuned into that. Um, I think there's a, a number of factors, not just one thing that we can point towards. Uh, the relationship with Tony Wolf also was uh, opening up around that time. And she was very much his, his guide, almost like his Ariadne's thread that helped bring him back into this world as he was undergoing those experiences. So I, I always, like to bring Tony Wolf in just because uh, we can sometimes have this uh, narrative of Jung doing it all by himself, which isn't, you know, we need our, our guides and we need our, um, the people who bring us back to this reality. And, um, and so the, the arc of the Red Book, it, it really begins with Jung recognizing that he's become disconnected from his soul. Uh, he has this extraordinary vision. Um, that comes two weeks apart spontaneously on a train journey of seeing all of Europe flooded uh, with this flood of blood that's destructive. And, you know, we have parallels between that and uh, this repeating dream that Tolkien had since childhood of a great flood or great wave, as he described it, that he connected to kind of drowning of Atlantis. And he wrote about this many, many times. Um, And so Jung's Red Book experience begins with these two visions of the flood. And then he realizes he's 
lost connection with his soul. And so he begins this practice of uh, night after night, kind of writing and calling out to his soul, my soul, my soul, where are you? And Mm. finally he makes contact with her. And when she starts to speak to him, she's, she's angry, she's furious. And she really kind of pushes against him and says, you know, you've tried to make me into a dead system. Uh, and mm-hmm. she's charging him with not just Jung, but what psychology has been doing of trying to kind of scientifically confine the soul, psyche, uh, the logos of psyche, the language of psyche, which so often we translate to his mind and we're forgetting that psyche is soul. Um, and so he makes this reconnection with soul. And then through his practice of active imagination, which is developing at this time, he starts having these full visionary experiences or what he calls fantasies, where he's now able to step into the experience and dialogue with the figures. And there's many, many figures who appear. Some are more maybe significant than others. There's the encounter in what he calls the mysterium with the prophet Elijah and his blind daughter, Salome, which of course have biblical echoes, um, but they're also very much their own people beyond the biblical Mm -hmm. narrative. And they really initiate him into this realm. They tell him, we are real and we're not symbols. And he has to take in what that means. He's trying to interpret what's happening as these figures are a part of him, maybe they're sub-personalities, but they're, if you take them seriously, they're saying, no, we're real. We have a, an individuality, even a kind of autonomy that's real to the internal realm. And what Jung comes to is recognizing mm-hmm. that, as he says, the, inf- the inner world is as infinite as the outer. You look out and you see the stars and the mountains and the trees and you look inward and you see the stars and the mountains and the trees. And, um, and so once Mm -hmm. he's accepted this, which I think Elijah and Salome really initiate him into with a kind of Christ-like death rebirth experience, then he's comfortably on his way. And we enter into from Liber Primus, which is the first book to Liber Secundus, the second book, which now we're in a really kind of mythological place. And he meets, um, you know, a scholar in a castle and his young kind of fairy tale like daughter, he meets, uh, a, a man who, you know, later you can kind of really understand, wow, he seems a lot like what we interpret today as Jung's shadow, uh, one of the lowly as he describes him. Uh, he meets the Red One, which is this kind of fantastic pagan, devil-like, joyous character who's you know, dressed, in, dressed in red and has red hair. Um, he meets an anchorite in the desert, Ammonius, and probably most Two of the most important encounters, one is with um, the god Isdubar, who is seeking immortality by traveling to the Western lands, and he encounters Jung, and Jung brings his scientific worldview to this, this god, Isdubar, and kind of shatters his mythic worldview that he you know, he's trying to reach these undying lands in the West, which is something that we have in Tolkien as well. The undying lands or the blessed realm in the West. He's trying to reach the sun there to gain immortality. And Jung says, well, you know, the sun doesn't set in these lands in the West. The sun is millions of miles away. And, you know, the Copernican revolution happens in these experiences. And that's a poison Mm. to this God. And what unfolds between them is a uh, a kind of death and rebirth of the God where Jung recognizes that he can save his life by convincing him that he's a fantasy, but he's a real fantasy. So we often think of fantasy and reality as these dichotomies. And what Jung is learning in the course of his Red Book experiences is that those actually start standing on the same side of that dividing line, that fantasy has its own reality. And as such, he's able to uh, actually save the life of this God and carry him down the mountain. And a beautiful parallel, actually, with 
the way in the Lord of the Rings, Sam carries Frodo up the mountain uh, as he's bringing the ring to the fire. Um, and then the last, probably most important encounter is with the, the magician Philemon, who is so similar to Gandalf. It's really remarkable. These wise old men with their you know, long white gray beards and big eyebrows and their living eyes um, who, you know, when you encounter, we encounter both of them for the first time in a garden uh, and they disorient the person they're talking to as, you know, they, they don't seem to be as powerful when you first meet them as you eventually realize with Gandalf the Grey becoming Gandalf the White, with Philemon kind of really stepping into not just being this magician, but this this powerful spiritual figure who becomes mm-hmm. Jung's guide. Um, so those are some of the main characters of the Red Book, and there's others, but it's, it is a kind of adventure story that Jung goes on uh, throughout the, the course of the Red Book. And, and I'm thinking that, you, you know, you just did this beautiful job of describing the Red Book and kind of one of the primary insights that comes from it, which is that the inner world has its own reality. And what I'm really struck by is, you know, you've told us your story of uh, finding the Lord of the Rings, and I think we each have our own. And I was, I think, Mm -hmm. 11 or 12 when I started reading it. And I still remember where I was sitting when I was reading it. And it was like realer than real. I think there's something about meeting it at that point in your life, too. But I mean, I I think I spend some part of every day in Middle Earth still all these decades later. Um, It's just a place I kind of go to in fantasy a lot. And um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, maybe part of the reason that those books have had such an impact on so many people as it had on you back then on me and I think on on Deb and Joseph, too, is because it wasn't just it wasn't just a. it wasn't just a novel for Tolkien. It really was an experience, his own kind of experience in this mundus imaginalis or in his inner world, like you said, where you there are the, the stars and the trees and there's a kind of infinite to it, or an infinite quality to it. And, and of course, you know, with his, um, I mean, you know, as we know, he created multiple languages Yes, you know, with their own grammar and vocabulary and scripts and everything. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just a. I mean, not that novels aren't wonderful things, but this isn't just a novel. This is a real um, chronicle of an inner adventure. Absolutely, it that's a great way of putting it. And both Jung and Tolkien use similar language in that way. That it's a a record or a chronicle of an experience, and you know, for both of them they reworked the mm-hmm. primary experiences to give us something like the Lord of the Rings isn't just raw from the imagination. He revised it again and again, which I think is necessary to be able to kind of hand the gem over to someone so that we can have the kind of experience that was coming to him maybe more spontaneously. Uh, and mm-hmm. it took a lot of kind of gleaning of Tolkien's letters and essays to really get a sense that, oh, right, he's actually intimating that this was an experience. He doesn't come out and say it in the same way that Jung does. You kind of have to dig to find that. But when you do, what he says over and over again was the sense that he wasn't inventing. He was discovering something that was really there. This is the language he used. It was there somewhere. Um, He uses similar language when he describes... uh, the languages that he invented where certain words would just come to him. And again, to find this out, it's a little bit couched in some of his fiction uh, that was unpublished during his lifetime uh, fiction, such as the lost road and the notion club papers, which anyone who wants to dig into this can find in uh, the 12 volume history of middle earth. It's all very kind of fascinating, but in those stories, he talks about ghost words coming through. And that he, huh. he couldn't, he'd hear the words and they came with set meanings and they couldn't be changed, but then he could build language around them. Now he's not saying that directly mm-hmm. in say a letter or an essay that he's hearing these ghost words. He's putting it in fiction, 
But if you look at what the words are, those are the exact words with the exact meanings that he's putting in his lexicons all the way back in 1915. So it's not hard. And those are the words that last all the way through. He can't change the meaning. You see them again and again, all the way, you know, his writing up through 1949 when he finished The Lord of the Rings. Um, he refers to things, he refers to something that he calls Farian dramas or elvish dramas. And some scholars interpret this as he's kind of making something up that seems a little bit silly. But if you really pay attention to what he's saying, it sounds like he's describing a visionary experience. And it's, you know, it's really a matter of how seriously do we take what Tolkien is saying about where these stories come from. And if we do take mm -hmm. them seriously, because what's his incentive in just making this up when he's so philosophically committed to working out exactly what's going on? that one can't help at least posit the idea that when he's talking about fairy and dramas, he seems to be describing something that's very comparable to Jung's active imagination experiences. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And in a way, he, he really corroborates uh, Jung's idea about the collective unconscious. Uh, that, that's, you know, these things came to him. Uh, he constructed whole languages. And I think it goes back to what you were saying, Lisa, of you, you know, you live uh, in those books because yeah. they have a psychic reality that something in us recognizes. Uh, and it gives it a special power uh, that there is a depth, there is another level or aspect of reality that belongs to the mundus imaginalis, as Henri Corbin had it. And Jung walked up and down in his garden talking to these imaginal figures and had conversations with them, and they told him things he did not know consciously. Uh, so it, it calls up a lot of, hmm, what really is going on here? And it seems wild to really seriously consider that both Jung and Tolkien and a whole host of others uh, have a knowledge of these, this other realm, the realm of psyche. And as Jung said over and over, psyche is real as an independent, separate reality. And some of us can access it. And, and your interest in uh, Henri Corbin and his paper on the Mundus Imaginalis seems so apropos. So just a bit for our listeners, that Corbin was very interested in these kind of 12th century Persian mystics and one of the things that struck him, similar to Becca's discovery, is that across time, they seem to be describing the same landscape, mm. which then creates this possibility that there is a knowable, imaginal landscape that many different people and across time can discover and map and find uh, similar anchoring points within these realms. And so standing there with Corbin's, I don't know his certainty, but certainly his inspiration, that there is a place that people go that Jung and Tolkien may very well have found the same world, describing it from slightly different entry points. So perhaps say, say something about how do you feel about that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I first encountered Corbin's work right around the time that my interest in exploring these parallels was coming up. And so it was a, a, a well-placed discovery, particularly that essay you brought up, the, the Mundus Imaginalis, or the imaginary and the imaginal, or it might be switched, the imaginal and the imaginary. 
And he makes this differentiation mm-hmm. between those words, which are very similar. And most people in our culture and the English language, you know, speak of things that are imaginary. And often what we mean by that is something that's simply made up, that we just uh, come, you know, we kind of pull it out of thin air and that it's not real and so forth. And Corbin is differentiating that imaginary from what he describes as the imaginal, which is, as he describes it, there's a reality to it that it's perceived through um, imaginative perception, but that it's not something we're simply making up, that we're uh, accessing it. And Mm -hmm. I would bring other language in here that comes more out of transpersonal spirituality, for example, um, around maybe not just accessing it, but we're enacting it. We're um, both calling it forth and participating in it, that there's two agencies happening here um, between our own human participation of the imagination in what Jung would call the collective unconscious, and that these archetypal forms come forward as, as figures who we can recognize and connect with, and um, that they come forward in this middle realm of the mundus imaginalis or the imaginal realm. Mm-hmm. Um, and you find references to this middle realm in, in many different cultures and contexts, usually spiritual, but sometimes philosophical. And Plato talks about the metaxi, which is this middle realm between the gods and human beings, uh, where you know, daimons sh- shuttle messages back and forth. And so there's been a lot of different uh, intimations of this middle realm. And of course, um, probably perks our ears up a little bit that Tolkien speaks of middle earth is this middle realm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what Corban is drawing forward based on these uh, medieval Islamic mystics is the whole topography of this imaginal realm and how we access it, that he says we access it through the, uh, through the organ of the imagination, or that active imagination itself is the mirror par excellence of the mundus imaginalis. And the way he describes it, he has this beautiful description where you go so far inward that you suddenly go through a topographical conversion. You go so far inward that you suddenly find yourself on the outside again. And that's when you find yourself in this other realm that isn't physical, but also we can perceive it. We can see it. We can smell it. We can hear. We can interact with it. But it isn't physical. We can't point to where it is. He says it's everywhere and it's nowhere, which when you think of the imagination makes sense. We can't pinpointed in a physical part of the body. And yet when you have these experiences, then you go through that topographical inversion and you find yourself there. He says part of that process is you never quite know the moment that you've made the shift into the other realm. You can't just leave a map that makes it easy to find the way there. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it would be too, it, it would be too simple to just enter in, oh, you do this, you go there, and and there you are, Um, that there's almost a a loss of the senses as we make that transition. And I've always found that interesting in certain fairy tales and stories and even works of fiction, where that crossing of the threshold into another realm is usually defined by losing particularly the sense of sight. And just to give a couple Fun examples. I mean, in the Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis, um, you know, the first image for that story came to him in a dream in 1916, same time period. And uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, the first time little Lucy Pevensey goes into the back of the wardrobe, she can't see. It's dark. She feels the coats. And then she suddenly becomes colder and she feels the prickles of the uh, the pines as she's suddenly in the forest. So sight is taken away. The other senses are heightened. Or in Harry Potter, she actually does this really well, um, that when Harry crosses into, through the platform nine and three quarters at the train <laughs> station, he closes his eyes. 
as he goes through. And you see this again and again, that the senses are taken away. Or even in The Lord of the Rings, when the Fellowship are brought into Lothlorien, which is probably the best example of fairy on Earth or the imaginal realm on Earth. Because Tolkien was really clear. Middle Earth isn't an imaginary place. It is our Earth, but in another time. Part of why it feels so familiar, I think. But Lothlorien is kind of this fairy and realm, and the Fellowship are all blindfolded as they cross the threshold in. We don't see the transition. But then when mm-hmm. the blindfolds are finally removed, the, way, the language Tolkien uses to describe their experiences of perceiving Lothlorien is that it was as though they were all colors that he knew, Frodo knew, but it was as though he was seeing them for the first time, as though they had just been freshly made and yeah. yet they were eternal. And this is the kind of language mystics use when they enter into these spaces and these realms. It's la- archetypal language where you get the sense it's brand new, it's never been seen before, and yet it is eternal and ancient at the same time. Um, So I love finding those examples in other stories where the senses are taken away and then we find ourselves having crossed the threshold. We have exciting news. We've given our Patreon page a transformative makeover. You'll find lots of exclusive content and a special offer through May. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will gain access to a new series of weekly bonus episodes. Here, all three of us explore your dreams and the questions you've wanted to ask. Elevate your experience to the $10 level where your voice gains power. Vote on future podcast topics and the special guests we invite, shaping the conversation and the community. And for those who want a closer, immersive experience, the $25 level opens the door to behind-the-scenes content and intimate live events, offering you a front-row seat to our creative process. This May, stepping up to any tier starting at $5 also gifts you free access to our exclusive new release, Remember Your Dreams, a This Jungian Life audio guide. This hour-long guide, set to be a paid offering later this year, will equip you to recall your dreams. The truth is, we've been waiting for you. All of you who understand the power and beauty of dreams and Jung's amazing ideas. If you're ready to join hands with us, find the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or visit patreon.com slash thisjungianlife all one word. Thank you for helping us produce and share this Jungian life. It's our most important contribution. We can't do it without you. So just to pick up on that and kind of conjecture for a second, we're talking about the importance of the imaginal. And you pointed out that in in the way we use imaginary in English, it's usually a little bit... um, uh, it, it's a it's a, it's it's a it's a little dismissive if something's imaginary, like you said, it's not real. But when you think about the imagination and why we have this faculty, why we evolved this ability to imagine something, I mean, what I assume is that it confers an adapt an adaptive advantage, an evolutionary advantage, because you can try things out in your imagination. If I do this, what's likely to happen? And that, I mean, that must have been like a huge leap forward to be able to kind of run a scenario in your head. And we know that when you experience something in the imagination, it has a real effect on you. You know, so that's why um, elite athletes will, will practice their craft in the imagination. You know, they'll work with a sports psychologist on just picturing doing something and that that changes how your body does it the next time. And we know this too from our work, that when you have an experience in the imagination, something real has happened, at least in the inner world, Mm -hmm. that then has an effect on the outer world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think of it that we have an extra organ 
you know, we have our five senses. And then our sixth sense is our ability to apprehend a, a psychic phenomena. We have a psychic organ of perception. And it's not uh, as sort of distant uh, as we might be making it sound. I mean, somebody like Tolkien or Jung, who, who could write their incredible works, had extraordinary access to this. But many, many people have had uh, a, a big archetypally uh, infused dream, and they wake up and they say, nothing in me created this dream. Uh, and, of course, Jung contributed active imagination to the world, where he writes this letter to a Mr. O, who must have written to him saying, just how do you do this thing? And Jung writes back, just imagine something like that big yellow mass in your dream last week. That doesn't sound too exciting. And just hold it in mind until it moves of its own accord. And when I read that a long time ago, I was just starting out on my Jungian journey. I thought, all right, Dr. Jung, you're on. Um, and by God, it's true. The figures do take on their own independent activity, stuff you wouldn't think up on your own. Uh, so, so I think of Jung and Tolkien as, you know, they're, they're on a spectrum and they're way at one, one highly developed, well-attuned uh, end of this spectrum. But it's not unknown to the rest of us. I think historically, we find this in mystics and shamans only in as yes. much as the world was very difficult and that we're spending much, mm -hmm. of, much of our life force turning our senses outside to find food, to keep ourselves safe, to mm. keep our families safe. How many or what small percentage of people have the luxury mm. to turn inward? I think there's a term that I like, I came across a long time ago in the kind of occult world, of the inner sensorum that we have these five senses, which really come from a, a stimulation of certain brain centers, and that there are correlates that can be and are awakened, and we can carry into these dream worlds, as we said before, that we can turn inside and find that those same sensory centers are responsive to something. What you were saying, Becca, that I so resonated with is that we can open the inner senses and we can manufacture something, which is setting up the plan for the year to try to predict something that might come forward, because we, we own, as Deb, you were saying, we, we have access and ownership of a kind of internal landscape to yeah. practice our own creative powers, which is remarkable. So that's a manufacturing attitude versus a discovery. <laughs> that we go in and we discover something and we are surprised by it, just as you were saying. You stare at that mask and suddenly it said something. That's a discovery, not a, not a manufacturing mm -hmm. moment. And I think that helps people clarify a little bit about what is or isn't happening internally. And in many traditions, there's a great focus on lucid dreaming. And as you said, Becca, there is this falling asleep moment and then, a, and then an opening of the eyes in the yeah. other world mm -hmm. and a recognition that this, we're not in Kansas anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I can begin to explore this landscape that I have not manufactured, at least on a conscious level. Well, Joseph, I love that you invoked dreams because that, that is a journey to the imaginal realm every night. And it, it, we haven't manufactured it. And, you know, one of the remarkable things about dreams is you think there's no way that I could have, I would have ever come up with that, you know? And, uh, and we, you know, Becca, you, you shared, I think, I think the, 
the image that um, C.S. Lewis had, wasn't, didn't he have an image of uh, Mr. Tumnus underneath the lamppost? Wasn't that the image that occurred that to him was in the his image. dream? Yeah. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we know that Robert Louis Stevenson had a dream that led to uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And we, we are encountering something uh, I would say from the objective psyche in our dreams that we couldn't, that we couldn't manufacture, but, uh, but we can then engage with both, uh, both in active imagination and even in creative endeavors later. I think there's a really important differentiation that we can make where, you know, Corbin does it in his way between the imaginal and the imaginary. And it's not to dismiss the imaginary either. There's something important about that faculty of making up two and versus the imaginal where it, it is more like dreams where it's just coming through an active imagination is more along the lines of holding the container so that what wants to come through is able to independently while we're awake it's it's a waking dream it's consciously creating the space for a waking dream which is a little bit like lucid dreaming in that way as as joseph you were bringing up mm -hmm. i think the person who at least I've encountered, who delineates these differences around the imagination best is the, the romantic poet and philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He talks about mm. um, not only the imagination, but he actually breaks it down into what he calls the primary and the secondary imagination, and then something else that he calls fancy. And in terms of fancy, that's comparable to what Corban means when he talks about the imaginary. Because fancy, it's actually more like a cognitive ability that you mm -hmm. come up with something, you can visualize it, you're doing it consciously, and, but it's, it's more cognitive, it's more thinking-based, even while it's image-based. And I think, Joseph, that's a bit like what you're describing in terms of manufacturing. And then there's, he delineates the two forms of the imagination, which is the primary and the secondary imagination. In the primary imagination, let's see if I can remember this quote. Um, this is from Coleridge's mm. Biographia Literaria. And he says, the primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And as a repetition mm. in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. I'm always happy when I can remember that. Um, because what he's saying with that is the primary imagination is essentially the imagination of God, the infinite I am, that is creating the world we see around us, that we perceive. It's the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And so as human beings, we are living in the creation of God's imagination. And when we connect with that, when that comes through us as creative beings, that is what he calls the secondary imagination, where we then take that primary imagination of the divine and we reshape it and mold it and it comes through us, but it's coming from beyond us. And that's what we see in Jung's mm -hmm. Red Book or in Tolkien's or any of the great works of art where you get the sense that it's not just being made up. Something's coming through. And you hear that over and over again from artists and authors of I didn't make it up. It, it came through and then they shape it. That's what the secondary imagination <laughs> allows us to do. It's that craft of shaping it, mm -hmm. of being the artist, of being the channel, of catching it. Um, and so Coleridge gives really wonderful, helpful language to that, I think, that lets us see, well, there isn't just the imagination. There's these different forms of it that we, that we participate in, and they all have a different value. Um, that we can draw on. So Coleridge is, is one of my favorites to bring in for that I think reason. that we can, we might amplify this in, in the way that Jung talks about the difference between the archetype and the archetypal image. Mm -hmm. That the archetypes which we have not created, but exist a priori and are invisible to us, can touch the human soul and inspire um, endless numbers of images that all have a thread into this idea of the mind of God. So the archetypal images 
uh, the innumerable ways and then which we can then work on. And so we can see that similitude between Philemon and Gandalf, that there is an, something in the mind of God that is related to the wise old man or the magical old man. That is not something that they invented, but touches them and then this springing forth of all kinds of luxuriant variations of the archetype. Mm-hmm. Seems that there may be a, some similar, similarity between those things. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I think that that's something that can sometimes get lost in discourse around archetypal theory, is that differentiation between uh, the archetype in and of itself, which in some ways is ever receding. I do think we can have experiences, you know, in expanded states of consciousness where we get closer to perceiving more of the fullness of that archetype, where you can see kind of the full spectrum of its multivalence all at once. But we can never say, I mm-hmm. fully grasp it. We can, I think we can get closer. We can cross the veil. But then that differentiation that, that Jung is so clear about to always remind that the archetypal image is different. And that can sometimes get lost in our language when we refer to, refer to archetypal figures as archetypes or the archetypal image as archetypes. Um, so I'm glad you brought that forward because it's those are who show up in the middle realm. That, that's who we encounter in the imaginal realm is these archetypal figures, these archetypal manifestations that uh, have something behind them. And you know, Jung didn't mm-hmm. invent active imagination. He, I mean, he, he came up with that term for it and many other terms, the picture method, the transcendent function, but it has deep roots, um, particularly in Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. In Neoplatonism, they refer to it as theurgy, as God work. It's that invitation of the archetype to come forward clothed in the symbolism of a god or a deity so that we can have a direct encounter with them. Uh, you see it in, in Buddhist practice, for example, as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah, those lineages, I think, are really important that human beings have been doing this for a very, very long time. This reminds me of something that Rudolf Steiner talks about and many others who train people to have access to these extraordinary states mm-hmm. that when the inner sensorum awakens, that the first thing that we see, which still feels very real, is the subjective astral. That is, there is an imaginal world that coats us, so to speak, that is primarily um, populated by images of our own complexes. And even though, let's say, the mother complex has an archetypal root to it, it's simply, it is still going to show up, in a sense, contaminated by my own personal experiences. And so part of the work in many of the mystery traditions is how do we purify our understanding? How do we resolve these knots of emotional suffering so that we can look through that veil of the subjective imaginal world and begin to perceive something of the objective imaginal world. And for Steiner, that meant that he might be able to perceive someone and diagnose an illness and have that be accurately uh, known or perceive some psychic phenomena that is then confirmable but was accessed through this imaginal landscape. So there is this process of cleaning up the, um, the representations of the archetypal forces that are too subjective, too overly influenced by our sensory experiences, and that that is a real process, and it changes how we function on a personality level. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good point regarding the, you know, it's kind of recognizing one's own complexes, one's own biases, where we project. And at the same time, I think that we can identify what we might call a participatory epistemology here, that we are, mm. uh, we are always participating in something. And 
doing that cleaning up is essential to have a clearer view, but that we may, I would posit, we may never be fully perceiving in a totally objective sense, which can actually be a very liberating thought. Um, and that this idea of an, a participatory epistemology is that you know this this allows us to recognize why, for example, there's so many different mystical experiences. There's so many different religions around the world, and um, that it's an, a participatory perspective is a little different than, say, a perennialist perspective, where in per, you know perennialism we say that the uh, you know, there's a, a kind of inner esoteric core to all religious traditions, and that there's maybe a, a hierarchy of what is uh, the actual objective reality of the divine. And a participatory perspective rather says the, these are each valid to a certain extent um, because it's a co creation between whether it's an individual human being or an entire culture across time um, that's enacting or invoking forth from a, a mysterious divine something that uh, we then can experience. And it kind of accounts for that that diversity of mystical or religious or psychological or imaginal experience. Um, but mm -hmm. you, I think you're absolutely right that that process of cleaning up the biases and projections and complexes allows us a clearer view of what we are enacting, of what we are co-creating um, in, in relation to this mysterious divine or in relation to the collective unconscious. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, we, we just did this episode on near-death experiences. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I learned when I was preparing for that episode was that one of the core features of many NDEs is this sense of traveling rapidly over something or through space. And in Western cultures, it might be, you know, traveling rapidly through a tunnel. But if you are a Maori, your near-death experience might mean traveling, traveling rapidly over New Zealand to the kind of edge of the, uh, the island. And, and so it's the same kind of thing, right? It's like there's some kind of core architecture of the inner world that we all have access to, but we clothe it in our own experiences somehow. And, and the question, the fascinating question, which I don't think has an answer is, is it an, is it an actual space or is it the feature of our psyche that generates the same images? Like what, what is that? And, and I, I, I don't know exactly, and I'm not sure what Jung would say, but it's, it's a wonderful mystery. I'm very much a philosophical both and ist. <laughs> mm -hmm. In that yeah, yeah. it's, I, I wonder if it's both and. It is an actual yeah, yeah. place that we access and we co create with, and that it, it is a realm of the psyche. But then there's this question of, well, where does the psyche end? I think I, I align yes. much more with where <laughs> Jung ends up later in his career following his integration of synchronicity, that psyche is not internal to the human, uh, human being, but psyche saturates the world. Um, yeah. That we're participating. And we partake with, in it. Yeah. That we're <laughs> participating with the anima mundi, not just the anima. Yeah. Mm hmm it's very, very hopeful, isn't it? Uh, that this is this is here for everybody. It it resides in everybody. Uh, people like Jung and Tolkien really and truly inspire us. Uh, but this is, um, you know, a bottom up experience rather than you know, what many of us in the Western world were raised with, which was top down, um, you know, that there's a God up there and uh, here is the sacred work and um, it's been, been downloaded uh, versus, hey, you can experience this for yourself. And it is a mystery. Uh, it's, it's available to you. It, 
it's something that has amazed me again and again when I've taught classes or workshops that I can bring active imagination in as an experiential exercise. And it is just right below the surface. Like there is very little mm-hmm. you actually have to do to open people up to having their own active imagination experiences. And I remember how terrified I was the first time I proposed doing a workshop like this, where I thought, what if nothing happens? What if this yeah. just doesn't work? <laughs> and I, you know, I have a group of probably 40 participants. I'm the youngest person there at that point. I think I was like 30 years old. And it worked. I couldn't believe it. Everyone's bringing forward these just extraordinary experiences and they're drawing them and they're writing them and sharing them with each other. And then the amazing thing is we brought it into the group and I've seen this again and again is how many common themes were between what came up for people and they're different common themes every time it happens, which, you know, whatever's in the larger collective field that's coming through many people are tapping into and they're bringing their own material to it. That's that kind of participatory co-creation. But that collective piece is really fascinating. And I think that's what we see with Jung and Tolkien that it's pointing toward that even, um, even when there's differentiation, it's those parallels that really indicate there is some universal field that's shared here that we are connecting in with through the collective unconscious. And so I learned to trust more and more that these experiences are accessible, that um, it's just a matter of democratizing our relationship to the imagination. And that this isn't something that's exclusive to mystics or people who we deem as special and put up on pedestals like Jung. That this is a birthright as as hu- not just human beings, I would say, but as oh, that's great. cosmic beings, that because we are part of this cosmos, imagination is mm-hmm. our inheritance. And it's just a matter, you know, we live in a modern world that denies the reality of imagination. So we say things like, it was just made up. It was only a fantasy. It was merely a dream. We have these little disparaging mm-hmm. words mm-hmm. to throw out yeah. dreams and visions and fantasies and imagination. But if you take those words away, just, only, merely, and as Jung was being taught in the Red Book, a core to reality and a truth to these experiences, and we believe that they're real, that's an extraordinary recovery of a whole realm of human capacity that the Western modern mind in particular has stripped us of. And yet, it's, it's one of our great powers that we do deserve to have access to, uh, and that I think everyone in, in different ways does have access to, whether it's visual, for some people it's more auditory, even for some it's more emotional or somatic. That doesn't mean it isn't imagination, um, that it's something we can all connect into. You know, maybe for some it takes a little more practice or breaking down of the critical function and the ego. For others, it just happens like it did with Jung. But that's just, that's a scale of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a difference in in degree, not in kind, that we have that capacity. So to invoke uh, the the other great uh, British fantasy writer, we've we've already mentioned her, but uh, in in, uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, uh, Harry meets Dumbledore in some other place after Dumbledore is dead. And Harry says, tell me one last thing. Is this real or has this been happening in my head? And Dumbledore says, of course it is happening inside your head, Harry. But why on earth should that mean that it is not real? Mm -hmm. I love that quote. That's Mm. fantastic. (laughs) Let's go. Yeah, I love that quote. Yep. Let's go back for a minute because I, I don't want to give short shrift to your your incredible scholarly work in your dissertation that we all three read and really enjoyed. Um, what I mean, you found all of these parallels between these two red books. What's what's your sort of understanding of that? What what uh, what what implications? What are, what are the implications of that? Yeah. Hmm. Well, and one thing that that I'm always trying to be clear about is despite all these parallels, they're not the same book. 
there are many differences. We can learn a lot from their differences as well. But I think what it implies is that these two men were afforded this experience, this opportunity of entering into an imaginal realm at relatively the same times, like the doorway to that, that threshold, to cross that threshold opened at the same time for them, right as the First World War was breaking out. And so a very potent yeah. time historically. And in crossing into that realm, they encountered many of the same landscapes, figures, sometimes scenes, whether that's you know, the encounter with uh, the dragon or the great worm or serpent, whether that's uh, you know, a, an encounter with Ents in Tolkien's world. And uh, for Jung, he actually has an experience mm -hmm. of becoming this tree being who speaks an awful lot like Treebeard. Uh, they both encounter a host of the dead, mm -hmm. which I think is quite <laughs> significant. I mean, we can even find parallels between this imaginal realm and the, the land of the dead. Um, and, and again, many, many other, the parallels come through. Sometimes it's really potent and clear, like Philemon and Gandalf. In others, it's more like totally different figures, but you see the se same scene unfolding, or you almost feel like they're peering through a window on the same scene and maybe interpret mm -hmm. it differently, but it looks the same. Um, and or they, they paint it the same way. Or there's the same kind of uh, mythic background to something. Uh, you know, sometimes they have the same, there's like a dwarf of the same name, Mim, that's in Tolkien's mm -hmm. uh, Unfinished Tales and Jung's Red Book. But then you can also find that there's, that's connected to the Nibelungen lead, which is an older, you know, Germanic mythic story. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's common mythological roots shared between them, such as the Nibelungen lead. Obviously, mm. obviously the Judeo-Christian biblical tradition is huge in terms of influence. So there's some external influence, of course, in how they've been raised, the milieu that they, they uh, grew up in and, and so forth. But that doesn't mean they're not still direct encounters that they're having. Um, there's these extraordinary female figures that show up in both um, Salome or the young girl in the forest uh, in Jung's, who he comes to identify as his soul. I, I like to argue that it's maybe not his soul, but, but soul in a larger sense. And you, you see uh, in a collective sense, mm -hmm. or in Tolkien's, we have, of course, at, at a certain level, like Arwen and Galadriel, but then um, the Elbereth Gilthoniel, who's more like a divine goddess figure or the queen of fairy. And these personifications you could say of of the anima mundi herself that invited them into into this realm and so i think the implications really are that this doorway opened for them at the same time and they tread maybe not the same path all the time but they tread parallel paths through that imaginal realm and that the real gift of that that they brought out is an affirmation of the reality of that realm to affirm to other people that if you've had comparable experiences, mm. to trust that, to believe in that, to record your experiences with as much fidelity as they did theirs. And they, they took different paths in how they decided to record that. For Jung, he ultimately was more interested in the vision making capacity than the content of the visions themselves. Even though he recorded them so carefully, he wanted to understand what was at the back of them. And that's why his whole project goes in the direction of depth psychology. For Tolkien, it's different. He takes it in the direction of an artist and he makes it accessible to us through story, through language, and mm -hmm. those are two different, equally legitimate avenues. And I think there's other ways that we can express such, such experiences as well. But the point is taking them seriously. And I think that for both of them, it came forward at a time, as I was saying before, where 
such experiences weren't actually uh, recognized, uh, like given a legitimacy. Visionary experiences in, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century psychology are seen as pathological. This is a sign that something is wrong. A latent psychosis has been unleashed, which is what Jung at first thought when these experiences started. Yeah. And that radically redefines if you are having these experiences and you're able to integrate them, then that's not so much pathology, but actually just an, it's another level of human experience. And I think that's really the, the gift that reading these two uh, red books in tandem with each other allows us to see that, oh, there's something there that isn't just this one man is seeing it and that's it. They're both seeing it. And we can go further. I just chose to focus mm -hmm. on these two because that's what I'm interested in. And I found, you know, the timing in particular so con compelling with them. Um, but you can find many other parallels to that, which Jung was really interested in finding. He wanted to uh, find other examples of people who had had experiences such as his. And we can look back in history to someone like Hildegard von Bingen who was having mystical experiences mm -hmm. and Dante's divine comedy, amazing parallels between both red books and the divine comedy and his opening up into those realms as well. Um, you know, Nietzsche's Zarathustra, Goethe's Faust and, and many, many others uh, that, that we can point towards. And the more there's a consensus around imaginal reality, the more we can affirm it as not pathological, but again, as, as something that's inherent to maybe not just human nature, but to, to the psyche as a whole. Mm -hmm. So that's some of There's what... There's another dimension which I wanted to bring up is the difference between a stable imaginal landscape and events on the magical landscape that can be perceived from multiple perspectives, which is a really uncanny attitude that von Franz had. So for instance, sometimes she would talk about fairy tales and she would say, no, no, this isn't personal at all. Like this, the solar hero discovered a whole other way of being in this other realm, which changed how the collective unconscious functioned. And then we're left with these vestigial fairy tales because they're perceived and recorded and they have such power because Something new has changed in the collective. And this is something that also is implied with your thesis, not just that they found the same landscape, but they found a similar event happening at a similar time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we all see very objectively is that sometimes there is phenomena that will happen globally that could not have inspired each other. So for instance, pyramids are being built in Egypt and pyramids are being built in South America, mm -hmm. different pyramidal shapes. It's as if this technology, this architectural capacity is happening. It's an event that's happening in the collective and is pressing upon those who are capable of perceiving this. Calculus was discovered by uh, two different um, mathematicians in Europe at the same time. The theory of relativity was being brought forward by two different theorists at the same time. The one who we seem to have yeah. more knowledge of simply got more press or attention that way. The discovery of oxygen, uh, things like discovering a blast furnace happening in China and India, and which suggests that there are not just landscapes, but events that happen. And mm -hmm. these events then press. It's a field that is continuing to move and evolve. And things are changing in the collective unconscious. They are not simply structured and set. And that's another really uncanny, fun feeling. And I know von Franz really wanted people to to get a sense of that, but I think it's hard it's hard to hold on to that as a modern person, although I think 
in the ancient world, it was it was accepted that stuff's going on out there in the realm of the gods. It's not all, all set in stone. Absolutely, it's um, it's an maybe oh, yeah. related to that. Go ahead, Becca. All I was going to say was, uh, it's an affirmation that you know we have this worry in a very individualistic culture that you know, I have to get my ideas out or I have to say this before somebody else does. So I get credit. And actually, if we shifted our thinking to this more collective sense that, you know, this is just coming through, you don't own this. It's not about you. It's, it's actually an affirmation of what's coming through you. Oh, I articulated this and so did somebody else. And maybe that's actually a much greater validity than me trying to claim it all by myself and put my name and patent on it. Um, so we move from a more individualistic mm-hmm. to a collective way of understanding creativity, inspiration, new ideas along those lines. That's great. I really like that. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to pick up on something that you write about in your dissertation. You talk about when Jung and Tony Wolf go to Ravenna together in 1914. Do you do you want to sort of set that up and then I can I can read a little bit too. Why don't you why don't you explain what happened in Ravenna with Tony and and yeah. Jung? This is an amazing story that Jung records in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, and then it, it's brought forward in a biography of Tony Wolf by Nan Savage Healy. That it's called uh, Tony Wolf and C. G. Jung: A Collaboration. The book is, and so. The two of them went to Ravenna in Italy in 1914, and they were visiting. There's extraordinary mosaics there. I actually uh, intentionally went to Ravenna about five years ago (laughs) to be able to see some of these mosaics. And they went to this particular, it was a baptistry, and they saw these panels of mosaics there together. and they depicted this kind of series of, of baptism. I think it was um, St. Peter's baptism, perhaps. And, you know, baptism itself, as it traditionally was brought forward, is to invoke a near-death experience and a, a profound initiation or encounter with, with death and, you know, how that would bring about an expanded state of consciousness and initiation into spiritual perspective. and. So they're, they're looking at these panels and Jung said that, you know, there's a kind of odd blue light in the space, but they didn't really pay much attention to it. And they were discussing it for a long time, really taken in by these mosaics. And then they left and he, he didn't end up getting uh, any pictures of it. And, you know, he was hoping to find if there were reproductions of these mosaics somewhere that they could take home. Uh, these images. And so a friend of his who was going to Ravenna later on, he asked, you know, can you please look, this is where it is. This is the baptistry. Uh, Can you please go find Mm -hmm. uh, reproductions of these? Because I'd be very interested in having copies. So the acquaintance goes to Ravenna and brings back the report that no such mosaics exist and that they had actually, that baptistry in some centuries before, had been destroyed by a fire that had destroyed the, the particular mosaic. And it, it, Jung was just shocked because what this affirmed was that he and Tony Wolf had had a shared visionary experience that they weren't even aware of. And, he's, and that, that that's actually a great kind of affirmation as well of what we've been talking about in terms of how do you know? I remember one of the questions I was asked at my dissertation defense was, uh, well, how do you know a visionary experience is real versus, you know, you're just making it up or it is pathological or delusional. And I do think it comes down to this shared experience uh, that if you can affirm it, you know, if someone else is having the same experience, which we see with synchronicity, with, which we see in expanded states of consciousness at different times, um, or even you know the practice of amplification does that, where we're looking to other uh, you know myths, religions, uh, folklore, and so forth to ask, 
you know, is there something here that isn't solo belonging to the individual? And it's that bringing the imaginal into consensus reality that is so important. And it can happen in different ways. We don't all get such extraordinary experiences as Jung and, and Wolf and Ravenna, but it certainly makes one wonder. It all points to a context that we live in uh, to the degree that we know it and experience it or not. That's mysterious that many people have experienced that we, we can't explain in, in rational, cognitive, ego-oriented terms. But there it is. It's all around us. Uh, I, I love Corbin's term, the mundus imaginalis, that we're part of something bigger that, that is alive in its own right and that helps us be more alive if we let it. Absolutely. So uh, your dissertation is a real tour de force. and uh, Oh, my gosh. It really should be out in the world. Do you have plans to publish it? I would love to publish it. I haven't found uh, the right publisher for it yet, in, in part because there are a lot of images in it. Some of the great parallels are between the images mm -hmm. from Jung's Red Book, which are so beautiful, and images that Tolkien painted and drew in his Book of Ishness and his later stories. And... Um, so I, I'd like to find a publisher who could actually publish the whole thing, not just the words, but mm -hmm. be able to bring forward those images beautifully. And, um, you know, if that was someone like W.W. W. Norton, who did the, the Red Book, um, or, you know, Houghton Mifflin, who publishes you know, uh, Tolkien's stories and, and his artwork, that would, be, that would be my ideal. So it's been something I've been wanting to publish for a very long mm -hmm. time. And because uh, I finished it about six years ago. And then, of course, a new book project came into my lap about two years ago. I'm, I'm researching and writing the biography of, of Dr. Stanislav Grof, who's a pioneer in the realm of LSD psychotherapy. And uh, so once that came in, I've, I've just kind of been sitting on this, but I really would love to bring it out into the world. Well, and, and it would be a, a beautiful book to have out there. So we'll... Uh... We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. That sounds like a great opportunity for someone. So I, I, have, um, I have two more questions for you. One is, um, how is your elvish? <laughs> uh, <laughs> my elvish used to be excellent. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I figured that, actually. <laughs> I still have a few phrases accessible to me. You know, I, I, I know how to okay, properly let's hear greet them. an elf. Um, you know, to say hello, you say my govannen, which is kind of like greetings. Um, there's a very beautiful phrase, uh, Ellen Sila Lumen Nomentielvo, which is uh, a star shines upon the hour of our meeting. I know how to say thank you, <laughs> han, han le, or goodbye, namarie. Um, but I've forgotten a lot <laughs> since I was a teenager. Um, but <laughs> it, it comes back at different points. And um, I love translating the names. You know, all of the names in Tolkien's works are not made up. They are, they all have meanings. And you actually can, each name is like its own little um, myth of who the person is. So for example, mm -hmm. Aragorn, his name Great. translates as Lord of the Tree. First you think, well, what does that mean? But the, the fact that when he comes into his kingship, it isn't actually affirmed that he can take up that lineage until he finds the little white sapling of the white tree of Gondor that has this yes. whole you know, long lineage. So he is the Lord of the tree. And you just see that again and again, that the names mean something that tell you who the character is and what their destiny is meant to be. Um, so I love yeah, translating so those beautiful. names. But I don't remember <laughs> as much as I used to. <laughs> And my, my second question is, could the four of us meet in person sometime and cosplay? <laughs> and Joseph can be the wizard and you can be the elf and 
I'll be AON and Deb, you can be a hobbit. Okay. That'd be fun. Should we do that? That sounds absolutely yeah, so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> well, Becca, I think it's safe to say that a star has shone on the hour of our meeting. Mm. Oh, and yeah. So, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. And so how do you say goodbye? Namari. Elvish. Namari. Thank you Namari. so much. Okay. Namari. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it's you. It's really been a pleasure. Today's streamer is a, a woman. She's 25 years old, about to enter graduate school, and she has entitled her dream Sulphur Beach. And here's the dream. I was walking to the beach with a large group of people. It felt like a school trip, maybe. There was this pervading idea that going to the beach would be educative, maybe in some spiritual or intellectual way. We got to the beach, which was completely yellow-gray in tone, the sand, the sky, the water. There was such a strong sulfur smell that I nearly vomited. I saw others walking around, bobbing into the water. The smell was too strong for me. I turned away from the water toward a wooden plank that was on the sand and saw many small bugs crawling on it. Another woman around my age and I left the beach and walked toward a cabin. We entered the cabin and idly chatted. I forget about what, but it was friendly and pleasant. We agreed that we wouldn't go back to the beach. However, I did go back eventually and with a large group walked to the shoreline and entered the water. I ducked my head underneath. To my surprise, I could no longer smell the sulfur. I opened my eyes underwater, expecting to be illuminated by some beautiful sight or newfound knowledge. It was just cloudy, that same gray-yellow color. I was slightly disappointed, but not that surprised. I bobbed my head above water and noticed the sulfur smell again, but it was much less strong. For context, our dreamer says, I was recently accepted to graduate school, a lifelong goal of mine, only to realize I became depressed after my acceptance. I've also been enduring some lack of passion and ambivalence in my relationship of seven years. I found myself extremely attracted to another person and felt some guilt about this. The main feelings in the dream, she says, were disgust at the sulfur, sulfur smell, gentle kindness and comfort with my companion at the cabin, and satisfaction mixed with other things. So, with this to go on, what do we make of the dream of Sulphur Beach? Um, just one small thing, because uh, in Virginia, there actually is a, uh, <laughs> a little resort town that's been there, I don't know, for well over 100 years, Sulphur Springs. Oh, for and, heaven's uh, sake. There, there's this um, healing attribution People bathe in sulfur, sulfurous hot springs, and they receive a kind of value in that. And from a purely um, scientific standpoint, sulfur has um, antifungal and antimicrobial benefits. So I think that uh, certainly in the ancient ah. world, you would have had, God knows, you know, any number of kind of skin disorders. And soaking in a hot sulfurous bath could actually have healing properties in as much it could treat some yeah. of those things. So I think there's an old tradition of, of tolerating that rotten egg smell if, if you have um, credible evidence that it's going to help you in some way. And it's a big symbol in uh, alchemy as well, is it not? Mm -hmm. of, of what sulfur is uh, stands for is heat. Am I correct about that? Yes, I think that when sulfur burns, it has a particularly hot 
um, flame that it generates very bright, very hot, and very stinky. <laughs> so the, uh, I don't know whether she says there's much heat there. I mean, I'm fantasizing because of the hot springs, but I don't know that she says anything about warmth. Yeah. Uh, no, it's the stink. It's the rotten egg stink mm -hmm. part uh, mm -hmm. for her at the beach. Um, and it feels like maybe a school trip. So uh, she's just been accepted to graduate school. And uh, so she is on a school trip <laughs> in her waking world life as a grad student. But I can imagine that that also takes us back to the realm of of younger years, and what is it like to be a student again? Uh, she's 25, she's been, you know, an adult, and uh, when studentship is evoked, uh, it calls up a, a certain status of, of the good news is you're going to receive and be fed, you know, knowledge and education and wisdom and all those wonderful things. But um, hierarchically, you're one down uh, because there's wherever there's a student, there's a teacher. So it calls up adult-child uh, dynamics. And 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 perhaps that's part of her ambivalence and the depression that that it seems it might mm -hmm. seem inflating initially to be chosen. Uh, that you fought your way to get accepted into the grad school seems mm -hmm. wonderful. Then the other side of it is you are subjected in a kind of parent-child way to the the system, the teachers, the demands, the assessment process. Right, right. And uh, that can bring up a lot of ambivalent feelings, uh, particularly returning to school later in life. Mm-hmm. There is a real transition and a real um, ambiguity about having this as a lifelong goal mm -hmm. in whatever discipline she has chosen. But obviously something I always wanted to get a graduate degree in X or Y. Mm -hmm. And now uh, that the dream is here, it also entails a kind of regression uh, to student status. Uh, it, it can look and feel uh, very much that way. But um, I want to go back to, the, to just the dream, that this odd, odd beach, uh, which is very murky in color. I mean, uh, these colors, yellow and gray, um, you know, so, sound sort of sickly, don't they? Um, you know, that, uh, and the strong sulfur s smell, and she's at the beach. Uh, so other people are walking around, and they're bobbing in the water. Uh, other people seem not to be affected uh, by, by the situation, by the, by the setting of, uh, that, she's, that she's in. Um, and then we have the plank and the little bugs crawling on it, which often, I think, multiplicities and multiplicities of things like worms and bugs, insects, um, are, are kind of primal feelings that are diffuse. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They haven't been consolidated into a single image, but just something uh, way below uh, the level of, of consciousness that is hard to connect with. Uh, she befriends a woman. They enter a cabin. She feels um, the kindness and comfort of having a positive shadow figure here. Uh, and then she goes back to the beach. Ducks her head underwater, could no longer smell the sulfur. Uh, and then she says, I expected to be, I think this is really informative, I expected to be illuminated by some beautiful sight or newfound knowledge. But, darn it, it just was cloudy, the same gray-yellow color. And she says, I was disappointed but not surprised. 
Uh, so as she gets into the water, the sulfur, the stink decreases. The colors stay the same. So I wonder if, you know, it's the, the goal of going to the beach, of going, getting into graduate school is <laughs> not... Not quite as uh, transformative, <laughs> right? It, it's. I it love the metaphor. Me. Like people yeah. ask you, like, "How was graduate school?" It was one endless sulfurous beach. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is such a fabulous <laughs> way of describing going back to graduate school. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it's not absolutely transformative. Of you know, I was shown into a beautiful room filled with ancient, uh, illuminated manuscripts, and it's like, oh, okay, oh, it's gonna be, um, yeah. it's gonna be a walk on the beach, and Rotten some of eggs it's gonna, for everyone. <laughs> some of it's gonna stink. <laughs> absolutely, and um, <laughs> what I think is is perhaps helpful is that um, there are plenty of other parts of the psyche that are adapting. They're in the water. They seem <laughs> untroubled yeah. by it. They're coping yeah. at the very least or maybe able to receive some benefit from the sulfurous mm -hmm. water. I think it's interesting that when you look at deeper, you don't notice the stinkiness quite so much. Mm-hmm. He goes yes. under, it's cloudy, you know, meaning yeah. that there's stuff to discover. There's stuff that isn't quite clear, but at least you're looking below the surface of things. Right. And there's work right. to be done to clear it up, but it's not quite mm -hmm. so rank if we go deep. But on the surface, you know, it's, it's definitely kind of stinky. Yeah. The other thing that um, is just true about uh, sulfurous odors is that when protein uh, degrades, it releases sulfur, um, sulfur oxide. So globulin, which is a part of most bodies, animal bodies, human bodies, and as the body decays, the glob uh, globulin molecules kind of break open and they release various uh, compounds of sulfur. One, that mm. tells us as humans, this smell is bad, I probably should stay away from it, because um, Disgust is a primal emotion. Yeah. Infants feel disgust, which keeps yeah. them alive, so they, they know to pull away from things that could be damaging or dangerous for them. So there's also something that could be breaking down. Again, it could be the mm. smell of the, of the rotting inflation, mm -hmm. you know? That uh, I just yeah. thought it was going to be so glorious, and that's just rotting right in front of me, and it uh -huh. smells bad. Well, you're bringing up something I think that might uh, be relevant to the dreamer's life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that she says uh, she became depressed after her acceptance. Yeah. So, you know, we're sort of wondering, you know, could the sulfurous beach and all the rest of it be like the letdown after? You know, what if the dream comes true and then you wake up the next morning and you still have to brush your teeth and <laughs> eat breakfast? Um, and yeah. then she says she's been enduring some lack of passion and mm. ambivalence in her relationship of seven years and she found herself attracted to someone else. Yeah. And I wonder if that relates to what you're saying about the sulfur of that it's um, an element in things breaking down. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So the breaking down of the old relationship. Mm. And as you said earlier, sulfur is uh, connected to the calcinatio in alchemy because when it's set on fire, it burns yeah. very hotly. So yeah. the sulfur could be part of the heat of the new relationship as well as the decay of the old. It's interesting that yeah. depending on how it's, how it's discovered, it, it can be so different. And that's true about the psyche, isn't it? That, mm -hmm. um, that it, we're just so differently affected in various ways. Mm. So I think that um, what's good is that she tolerates it in the dream. She vomits. It's rough on her. 
it's not appealing. It's hard to digest, right? Because when you vomit, you're like tossing things out mm. of your belly that your, your body is like, I don't, I don't want to keep this in there. But, you know, mm-hmm. she's able to kind of keep herself together. Right. And, and, and the has, dream gives her a couple of good uh, little tips about what's working here. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that is working uh, is, is going back to this cabin. Right. And uh, she says in the dream, idly chatted uh, with, with the woman, but it was friendly and pleasant. So I would kind of build on that and say, mm-hmm. get support. Oh. Uh, go out to coffee with a friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, go out to dinner. Um, talk on the phone. Uh, maintain those seemingly, you know, sort of casual, chit-chatty kinds of relationships. They are uh, they're relationships you already have. They are uh, trails through, uh, through an unknown and new terrain. Mm-hmm. And the other is that things are better when she co- goes back to the beach mm-hmm. and uh, puts her head under the water. Right. That when you get under the surface of things, that helps too. Yes. It's a very homey dream. There's nothing <laughs> glorious about it. Right. And I love the, her final just few sentences. You know, I went into grad school expecting to be illuminated by some beautiful (laughs) sight and newfound knowledge, and what I Uh. found was just kind of cloudy and grayish yellow. I'm feeling kind of disappointed, but not surprised. (laughs) And you know, and when I resurfaced, it's not quite as bad as I thought it was going to (laughs) be. And (laughs) welcome to grad school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I dare to say. There will be illumination too. It's been a lifelong goal, and yes. um, new beginnings. Beginnings are hard. Beginnings are just hard, and so are endings. And you may find that the companionship that you discover being back in grad school may be the surprising, wonderful thing. And I know I felt yeah. that training with you and Lisa. That's that true too. You go in thinking, "Oh, it's going to become a wizard of a Jungian." And there's all of these life-changing relationships that you carry away. And Mm. and that is, for me, was equally as valuable as any information I might have had. So she might be surprised at the friendships that she carries back. So we will wish our dreamer well on this new part of her life journey. Yes, we will. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.